uh, welcome everyone. Uh, I'm going to go through a little bit of the a uh, little little bit of uh, the introduction uh, of myself, uh, real basic uh, Automot history. Talk about our our customer base, use cases, the features of Automod, and case studies, and some Q and A. Hopefully, we can get through this. There's a lot of a lot of material. My goal is to just educate you if you're not familiar, of course, with Automod and and uh, where it can really bring you value. Uh, that's my goal today. Uh, and hopefully it'll generate some questions and follow-up activities uh, upon completion. So just basically, this is me, Dan Muller. I'm the Global Product Manager for Automod. So I've been with, uh, it's going on 27 years with Applied Materials. Actually, it's been 10 years. Applied acquired us in 2007. Uh, I, I joined when we were privately owned as Auto Simulations, which goes back to 1992. Uh, where they hired me to do consulting on the East Coast. I'm based outside of Philadelphia. So I've been doing, I did consulting, uh, simulation consulting with Automod for probably 15, over 15 of those years. And now I've, I've worked in worldwide pre-sales. I work with our distributors. And now I've moved to managing the product. And I have degrees in industrial engineering from uh, Georgia Tech and, 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 and uh, University of Pittsburgh. So a little bit about Automod. Automod was developed uh, in the 80s, actually. Uh, it was the first simulation, first 3D simulation product on the market. It was actually developed, we say, for engineers by engineers. So these, there was a need in the material handling industry by Eaton Kenway. And uh, some of the engineers at Eaton Kenway out in Salt Lake City area uh, broke off and decided to develop a simulation product, which was way back when was Automod, originally developed in GPSSH, for those who go back that far. Um, but it, it was developed, and you'll see when we get to the level of detail, um, why, uh, you know, you can see where all the material handling influence has come into the product and why it's so powerful in uh, manufacturing, material handling, uh, distribution, and logistics operations due to uh, the constructs we have for modeling the material movement. So uh, hopefully that will come across quite evidently as we go through uh, the presentation. It is the one of the most uh, used simulation products for analyzing material handling requirements. A lot of the, and you'll see the customer list, a lot of the material handling companies, the systems integrators, uh, and design houses uh, use Automod because of uh, the power it provides them in their analytics. Uh, the other thing is, the important thing is you, you control. As a user, you control the level of graphics. I'll talk about that more and more as I show you some examples. Lots of products today you know, look, you know, the, 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 you can build models that are really nice and slick. Uh, the level of detail of the graphics is incredible, but that's going to come back to bite you when you, if you have a large model and you need to do analysis. So you, we let you control the level of detail, and I'll show you a couple of examples, and that allow you to uh, improve performance of uh, the CPU when you have large models, and uh, as well as improve the efficiency in, in developing the models. So this is literally years ago. This was our nice, fancy station wagon or vehicle that we used to model. Of course, in today's environment, you can get to all the textures, the light sourcing, the reflections. So the evolution of the graphics, right, relative to Automod and, and other products in the market have, you know, come really, really all the way from the, from the gaming industry, uh, incredible level of detail. And we used to, years ago, my first computer was a, uh, Silicon Graphics Unix workstation was the only thing that could run 3D graphics. With the gaming industry now, the, the PCs and all the graphics cards, right, help drive everything to the PC and the level of detail you can get to, into on your laptop now surpasses anything we could do years ago. And I talked about graphics complexity. You could do texturing, light sources. You could do all these imagery on the material moving, right? These are just desktop computers flowing on, on, uh, on conveyors. And the level of detail and the shading, you can get into this level. It's great for presentations. doesn't buy you much for your analytics. So where is Automod used in, in different industries? Well, let's talk about the footprint of Automod. Of course, it is. we say it's the industry standard for modeling complex automated material handling worldwide. Right? We have, we have uh, coverage with distributors and direct uh, applied sales offices around the world. Use, of course, a ton in the automotives. Uh, warehousing and logistics operations, airports, right, all over the world is used for airports for baggage handling type systems. Automod is the, is, a, is the product of choice there. The systems integrators, the Siemens, the Van der Lander, a lot of these other ones are in there. Very big in semiconductor because they're highly automated and a lot of other air, uh, industries as well. So just a snapshot. Every, every simulation vendor will have a series of, of similar types of slides, uh, I believe. But we have, what differentiates us is the, the, the material handling pieces, which we're going to go to in a second. 
here's another list of the types of users. You have the consumer products companies, you have the system integrators, designers, consulting firms and services companies like PMC themselves, uh, and you have a lot of the high tech uh, companies are big users of, of the product. As well, you know, I, I, I don't have them all listed, but you know, a lot of the automotive companies are big users of Automod, and here's some others. Did, Walt Disney, you'd be surprised. Walt Disney's a, a really big user. They model a lot of their infrastructure, underground operations, even rides using Automod. Uh, and, the, and the heavy metals, the Alcoas, the, the steel and, and, and aluminum type companies, and aircraft assembly type companies are big because of our uh, overhead uh, gantry cranes. And then uh, the distribution type companies that have a lot of sortation needs. You know, Automod is just one of those products that can handle large type of operations, including ports. So Automod is very big in the logistics operations and modeling. So let me just dive in as, as we go. Hopefully you can start thinking about questions you'll have at the end. But let's just talk about basically Automod's features. Automod is, of course, on the PC. It's on Windows 7, 8, 10. Right? We work with ActiveX. Uh, we model true to scale in a 3D environment. So when you're laying everything out on the screen, whether it's a conveyor or whether it's a path that a vehicle or fork truck or aisle ways, we take everything into account for the actual uh, size. I'll talk about that in a minute, the distances. We have accelerations, decelerations. So we're using the, the physical movement requirements necessary to determine the amount of time it's going to take as, say, a vehicle is, is, is moving through the system. And if there's a local blockage, it has to decelerate. So we have to take distances into account. So it models the, those, it models those, those, those uh, physics attributes relative to their acceleration and deceleration. Uh, we have, an, we have our own language, which every product probably has a language of its own. We have our own language that it's, it's pretty easy to use, but of course it does take time to, to go to a training class and learn it. But it gives you the ultimate control, and I'll talk about that, and that's where the power of Automod comes in. We have a statistical analytical package, and I'll just touch on that a little bit, but it lets you do your design of experiments, multivariable analysis. Very, very powerful tool that lets you go and launch your runs, literally, with one license, you can launch your, 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 your statistical runs utilizing multiple cores on your machine or even using multiple machines uh, in your environment to get your results. Because when you do your uh, analytics, you may have many, many variables that you want to look at the sensitivity analysis around. And being able to make a lot of runs simultaneously and efficiently capture those results is really important in order for you to get your analysis done and, and reporting uh, to upper management uh, in a very efficient time frame. So I'll go on from there. Why Automod? We've been around literally for th over 30 years. Uh, and if you talk to some of our core users that have used it for quite a long time, they, they, they love it. They love the power. Uh, and it's really a, a, a product that has been you know, tried, tested, and proven uh, for decades. You control the level of detail, not the product. That's key. You can model things simple, simple or you can model complex. And you, you don't, you're not, you're not, um, you know, it's not the software that's driving that. It's you have control of that. Of course, the real world accuracy has always been important, the flexibility, and and the powerful communications relative to the level you can get into for your for your graphics. So we have what we call the industry best material handling templates, and other companies, you know, try to copy us because we were the first, and of course, the level of detail, and we have path mover, and we're going to go into each one of these. Path mover, conveyors, power and free, automated storage and retrieval type systems, the bridge cranes, and we have uh, the last one is a uh, kinematics or robotics type of uh, system. So I'm going to walk through and give you examples and show you um, some videos of models just to be efficient in time on uh, you know, the capabilities and the level of detail you can get into in some of these uh, graphics. When we talk about accuracy, part of this presentation that was performance, scalability, and accuracy, right? So Automod has a lot of default controls. Uh, there's nothing hidden. Things are there. We document everything. We have flow charts. I don't expect you to read this. It's very small. But the idea is we allow the user to access many different, say, intercept points as things are occurring in the simulation model for you to do customization. So you can accept the default logic, which is documented, or there's many different points where you can interact to do your own, say, vehicle scheduling logic or, you know, or make other types of decisions at certain points on routing material. So there's a lot of detail that's behind the scenes, but you can override that. 
uh, which is necessary almost with any system of complexity. It's required for you to build your own IP into the model. Uh, you need to be able to access uh, decisions and at certain points in the, in the processes of whether it's uh, people or equipment uh, in, order to, in order to accurately model your system. You know, other companies will, will, will show you uh, a really nice drag and drop, let's build a model, but really, how many people build a, a banking model, a, straight, a straightforward queuing model? Uh, that's okay, yeah, you can do that, with, with, but when you get into the developing your logic in the system with the tool, you almost always have to get down to a la language level. And Automat has a, has a very powerful language uh, that allows that control and data integration. So let's take a look real quick at the path mover environment. Path mover is just a vehicle system. We call it path mover because it's not just, like in this picture, it's not just a fork truck. I've used it for fork trucks. I've used it for automated guided vehicles. I've used it for elevators or vertical lifts. All right, you customize the path mover system. For example, it could be the taxiway at an airport where the airplane's coming in or the runways. I've modeled that as well. So you, it's only limited to based how you customize it and parameterize uh, the system, right? So, for example, vehicles have, and this is the level of detail I want to show you from an engineering perspective, vehicles traveling this system, you have uh, acceleration, deceleration, whether you're going forward, whether you're going around a curve, we have special paths that are dead ends called spurs. You go backwards, you have a different speed and, and, and velocity for going in reverse direction. Right? and if you have to rotate. So you could customize these parameters for almost almost any type of vehicle system, uh, you can, you, whether it's, a, like I said, an AGV, a fork truck. I'll show you some examples that are you know, tractor trailers outside of a facility. So there's all different types, a, a, a cart on track type of system, a monorail type of system. All these can be customized, and you can define your units, whether they're in metric or, or English uh, units. Right? And when you're laying pads out, when we lay pads pads out on the screen, you can you, you have control whether it's a one directional or two directional path. You have other controls. You also have um, speed limits. So in other words, if you have an area where there's operators walking around or, 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 or the vehicle needs to slow down through a certain area, you can actually set a speed limit on the trap. And even though the vehicle may be able to go, you know, a couple hundred feet per minute, right? or faster, you might have it slow down. And you could do it in miles per hour, depending upon the types of systems. So you can have it slow down through certain areas, so it'll have to decelerate before it hits that path. And once it's off that path, it'll pick up with whatever its default speed and performance parameters are, or if there's other traffic limits or speed limits on the, on the path. So there's a lot of customization you can do in just laying out uh, the system. So path mover, very powerful. Let me show you a couple examples, and, these, and I'll talk, too, about the graphics. So I'm going to launch this. Hopefully it comes across on everybody's video. So this is done by my uh, distributor in, in France. This is a fully automated warehouse uh, that they modeled. Now, they, they went crazy with the level of graphics for creating the video. Right? Typically, you wouldn't need to show the grass or you wouldn't show. You, you'd show the, the vehicles coming in and you'd have all the locations that they go to. You ne wouldn't necessarily show the walls for the analytics. But they went, they went uh, after they did their analysis, they went, I'm just going to jump around because I don't want it to play the whole time. This is inside the four walls now. That's the fork truck there unloading. They put codes on their pallets, right? They have an automated storage and retrieval system, right? This is a pretty good, pretty size, pretty good size model. And we, we've done models that are much larger than this, but this has a really, they really went overboard in the level of animation for these. You've got these vehicles, vehicles on tracks. You also have an overhead type of vehicle system on track that's interacting with the the ASRS. So in this system, this has a lot of different vehicle types, the fork trucks and these vehicles on the tracks and the modeling, all the details, as well as this is an automated storage and retrieval system. About that shortly. So just to give you an idea, you can get to this level of detail, right, which is really great for, for presentation purposes. Then if you take a look at this other model I'll launch. So this is one. This was done by uh, my distributor in Korea. This is a uh, kind of like a refurbishing of um, subway cars. And you can see it's not as glitzy, per se, as that other model, because the fork trucks are pretty vanilla. You know, the, 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 the subway cars don't have a lot of contouring. But from an analytical perspective, right, to do the analysis, here you have an overhead bridge crane with some kinematics that drop to lift the car up. So they, this shows you, um, you know, some of the other different systems. But the level of detail to do the analysis, this would be more of a typical, I would say, Typical type of level of graphics potentially, maybe even you know a little bit more than you might need for your initial analyses, but it's you know accurate and it 
does what's needed to get the job done. Here they have some operators that are servicing and, and refurbishing the, the material necessary under undercarriage of the subway, and they just show um, show them there. Stuff transfer is a little turntable. This would be a kinematic that rotates. So just give you different pieces of the of the uh, automod, and then they're they're rebuilding it, right? I just they had the rebuilding uh, the car to go back out uh, to be serviced or back out to the fleet. So simple example. A little bit less level of graphics, but has uh, vehicle systems and other systems. So path mover um, can represent many different types of systems. Uh, of course, one of the larger, one of the other large systems that we use. Typically, most customers will, will have uh, path systems and conveyors. They're the two most uh, popular, say, modules. We call these modules in Automod. They're the most uh, most used modules are path mover and conveyors. And conveyors, of course, have a lot of detail associated with it. You can just imagine uh, in the manufacturing environment. Um, you have the capability of, of course, photo eyes, motors. You can attach motors to conveyors, and then you have you can make them accumulating, non-accumulating. Here's just one of the windows. This is the windows for the conveyors. You set the width. You can set it in inches, feet. Right? Everything uh, can be changed, and you can set your default units uh, for the entire model that will populate these based off of your defaults. You don't have to change them. Uh, you can set them outside of this. But you have stuff like uh, whether it's an accumulating, yes or no. You could have motors, because you can turn on and off motors depending upon your logic. You could attach motors across multiple conveyors, right, based on how conveyors in the real system are, or how you drive them with, with the motors. You set, the, you, you set velocity, and there is an acceleration and deceleration, and people might ask why, but when you stop and start a conveyor, there is a very small amount of acceleration and deceleration for starting and stopping uh, a conveyor. And we have these other ones, stopping space, moving space, induction space, and fixed interval size. This allows you to customize these for if you have, for example, pressure rollers or zero pressure roller spacing type of conveyors. If you have a um, sorter in a, in, a, in a fulfillment operation, we have maybe a tilt tray sorter, and therefore we can define the separation between trays and fixed intervals where you can only put you know, one item within this window or it could span across multiple, multiple trays. You customize, based off your needs, how each piece of conveyor, each piece right, of conveyor is laid out on the screen. And typically, I'll talk about that in building a model. We typically bring in a CAD drawing. I'll go back to start the process. Typically, we import a CAD drawing. We can read uh, Autodesk CAD files. We can read them in. They come in the scale. And you ha it's usually like a tracing template. And then you know where the location of all your equipment, paths, aisles, conveyors are in the system. So we have that. So let me give you some examples of uh, conveyors used in different applications. Here is a, um, this is an Audi facility in China, just to give you an idea. So there's a lot of conveyors, a lot of different systems in these models. And this has pretty good graphics for, uh, you know, not overwhelming, but a pretty good level of graphics for this automotive uh, manufacturing line of these Audis. It might be a little grainy, but um, you can see it has different types. It has, it has like lifts. These could be either kinematics, these lifts, or actually could be a vehicle system. You have a, this here is, is probably a vehicle system shuttling back and forth. It's just a bi-directional vehicle, okay? And then you have, uh, what's really big with Automod in the automotive industry is, of course, we have the power and free construct, which I'll show you shortly, which is used a lot for, for automotive assembly uh, as well. And you can use vehicle systems. You could use conveyors. These could be conveyors as well. Um, so it's all, all throughout here. There's all different types of systems that go out. So here you see there's some power and free type of environment. Conveyors are probably over here. Power and free carrying the, carrying the, uh, the bodies of the cars. And here's a standard, right? Here's a really standard uh, type of, this is a little Honda, small parts warehouse. Get bigger, but this has inner, this has manual operations, manual picking up on the mezzanine. So you have uh, uh, people that just disappeared, but you have people picking up, uh, you know, order fulfillment type of information, and you have uh, fork trucks going down the aisleways picking up product that needs to fulfill orders. Stuff being stuff in cartons coming in on conveyors. This is kind of a this is a you know, this is these graphics are, are, are fine. The um, and I'll talk about how, you know, we'll talk about data, I think, as, as we go. Um, but, you know, we, we, I've done a lot of warehousing uh, and di distribution where you're, you're, you're actually driving, the, you're driving this whole system with the, you know, the product slotting 
we might not show every product in here, but we'll show where the operators and vehicles are going to pick uh, in order to represent the actual movement and pick times. And then, of course, they're, they're, they're traveling at certain rates uh, as well. So there's a lot of, um, a lot of detail. Uh, we drive it with actual orders. If we do different strategies for wave order picking, et cetera, then we, we can, can model that. Here's, a, here's another one. If uh, power and free, let me, go, let me switch. Uh, power and free, power and free, of course, is an accumulating type system. For those in the automotive industry, it's used heavily. It's a, a chain that runs, a, a, if you're not familiar with it, runs above the floor, and you have carriers that engage and disengage. Uh, very similar to conveyors, except it has carrier and carrier management. Uh, and used heavily in the automotive industry. A very similar, very similar approach where we define uh, the chain that's going around. So you can attach a motor. Uh, the chain, chain has velocity acceleration, so it's very similar constructs in modeling that, except now we have a carrier, and we have a carrier that we now have to define the, the, the size of the carrier, okay, how many of them we have on this, in this system, and then they'll have, each one will have, the carriers will have uh, parameters as well. There are some examples. This is a really nice engine assembly video, but it has the power and free transporting the engines, you know, through the through the operations. This this of course is was done for, for presentation purposes, the level of detail in showing the engines in this uh, in this application. The power and free is used a lot, uh, especially in the I say automotive assembly when you're doing the, the, the door assemblies uh, and and, and you know, other areas uh, it's used. You could also use it as a, also think about it, if you had something in the floor and it was like a tow line type of system, tow line type of conveyor, you can also have it in the floor representing some type of tow line system uh, in, inside the uh, facility. Now here's another much larger one that's carrying automotive bodies through through the operations. And as you can see, we are 3D right here. This gives you a good perspective. This this other one on, on you know getting a view and, and, and looking at the different elevations. And when you're building these and you're laying you're laying whether it's a path or laying a power and free system, you're you're, you're talking of uh, you know having to have the right elevation off the floor and when you're laying that out. So everything has to have a you know when you start developing these layouts and these paths and these flows, you're talking about working an X Y Z coordinate you know. Uh, system, right? So uh, it's important to know when you, when you have your elevation changes, right? So it's it's very important. So this is power and free. So automated storage and retrieval system. So this is of course you have you have aisles, you have bays, tiers, aisles, and you have the the storage and retrieval machine. So we you know we define it by uh, first we define how many aisles we have how many bays in each aisle, what is the width. So you're actually building the racking type system. And of course, with ASRS systems, they're typically uh, um, very symmetric, right? So many bays down, so many aisles, one crane per, per aisle. You can make exceptions. There's ways of doing exceptions if you have some type of uh, interference in some bays because of column structures and things. You can, you can build those exceptions into the system uh, where those, uh, uh, those openings might be blocked, things like that. You have that capability. So you have that, and then you have the cranes that go up and down each aisle, and you can see there's a horizontal component and a vertical component because you have the vehicle moving both simultaneously as it's moving down the aisle to get to the right bay. The, the shuttle is going up simultaneously to try to get to the right tier in order to do an extraction from the position it's being sent to. And you have all these different, of course, you can see the engineering, the deceleration, the velocity, the creep speed and creep distance is really kind of like the when it gets very close. At what point do you have to really slow down, and then you can take some fine positioning time, depending upon if the system requires that. So ASRS here's a here's a good model of a warehouse with really simplistic graphics, but this was a, a warehouse for uh, XL meat packing. All right, so this was a cold storage. Uh, stuff's coming in off say the, the production lines to be stored uh, in order to be sent out by truck. But it's just uh, ASRS systems and conveyors. Now the graphics here are just really simple. Right? This is simple, but good enough to, to, to get your analysis, your throughput, utilization of your equipment. Of course, based off driving and off of your, say, your production and your product mixes uh, in order to control where you're routing the material and doing your order fulfillment. So in, in this case, right, it's, it's pretty, uh, 
pretty vanilla when it comes to uh, the level of graphics. But this, like I said, it's it's perfectly fine. You don't have to spend a lot of time uh, building these graphics. We give you we give you templates in Automon. If you wanted to make things look prettier, you can, or you can keep them real simple. So that's uh, this is a kind of a straightforward little warehouse, little little AGV loop or vehicles on track type of loop down here as well, AGVs. And then uh, here's one that's used that was from uh, automotive. Uh, uh, ASRS uh, in an automotive storage system. That's a little bit nicer graphics. And these are older models. Today you can make these, like I said, you have reflection, lighting. You can make them look a lot, a lot nicer as well. I, had a, I just had a, I was just over in Korea, and my customer, my distributor over there, is doing a, doing a um, baggage handling system for Korea Airport, and they're modeling all the planes coming in. And they went, out, they went out to SketchUp. Those are familiar with SketchUp. They were able to download all these different size planes and edit them, and they have all the different size planes based off of uh, the flight schedules and the type of planes. They have them coming into the gates to unload the bags or load the bags and taking out. So they added a, they added a lot of lot of detail in that in that model. So you can get as fancy or as simple as you want. So that's an automated storage re uh, retrieval system. Bridge crane for those who you know uh, don't work in the heavy industry or heavy assembly. We have a bridge crane con construct. Uh, and it allows you, of course, it's used a lot for the, the steel industry, aluminum industry. Uh, it's also used for aircraft assembly. All right. They have a lot of cranes moving the fuselage of a plane to different different areas as it's doing the assembly or the engines. Even the engines of these aircrafts are huge. Uh, but it's similar to an ASRS. You have the, the, the crane moving uh, above on the rails, but also the trolley is moving uh, back and forth to get over where it needs to pick up the material. Bridge cranes are used a lot in uh, port operations. So here's a here's a model of a port. To give you an idea, this is kind of good. It gives you an idea of the scalability. You're not limited by the four walls of your facility. Uh, we've, we've done a model. I'll talk a little bit about a model we did for Dell at the end in the case studies. But we went beyond the walls to parking lots where they stored in a secure lot some of the uh, uh, high-cost items. Uh, that they had to store, and we modeled the, the material flow outside the facility coming in from suppliers. Likewise, you could model, uh, you know, material coming in from different locations or outside of the four walls. Ports, we, we've done, uh, you know, these, some of these ports are a couple kilometers long, so you're not limited by size at all with uh, with Automod, right? It's all it's all memory anymore, but you have a, a lot of capability in the model. The, the, the scalability is, is, is very good with Automod. Here's some kinematics and some, some, some things going on. And here's another, another. this is a bridge crane, but this is a, a, a palletization system. It uses a, you know, a crane uh, with some kinematics for articulation, uh, picking up and dropping off in a, in a palletization type system. So this is more, this gives you an idea too where you don't have to model a full system. Uh, the whole facility. If you're looking to model a certain area and you know what the inputs are into that area and you want to just analyze it uh, within a certain uh, area, you can build you can build little subsystem models or even equipment models in order to analyze the performance and throughput. As long as you know what the data necessary to drive it, you don't necessarily have to build an entire facility if your area of interest is really you have a good focus on on that and have good control and data that can drive a, a simulation that's a portion of your facility. So that's some examples of bridge cranes. And then kinematics. Uh, kinematics are interesting because they're the robotics piece of Automod. So you have translational, rotational joints. You could build the robots. We have some you know, default robots we have that we, lots, lots of people start with, of course, welding robots. right? You can, you be, we, we define the configuration of how we want to move and how long it takes to move so we can be precise in our movement. So kinematics, I'll show you. So here's an example of... Uh, some pick and place type robots in an in 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 automated manufacturing type of environment. So you can see all the different types of uh, articulation of these robots. And it may not necessarily just be a robot like this. A shuttle type of a, a shuttle could be a, a, a kinematic as well. You can customize it. When we show fork trucks lifting material off the floor into positions, we typically have a kinematic that's the forks that show it going up when we're going to, to, to lift it or, or uh, 
extract out. So there's different things going on there. So even turntables tend to be kinematics because they have the rotational piece. So where we have turntables, we often use uh, kinematics to represent you know, the, the turntables. So right here, it's probably going to spin. There you go. Yep. So this is a this is a nice little model. This is our this is my distributor in China. So this is a model that they did. I try to get more recent models to just show you some of the nicer graphics that some customers are, are using as well. So that's that one. This is just a simple uh, example of a little you know pick and place type of robot. Just just to show you. Um, being, being, uh, wow, it's nice graphics. And then build an insight, so picking and building a pallet. Okay. All right. So I talked brief, briefly about Autostat earlier. So once you have a model built, right, the whole idea is to get to the point where you want to do your analysis, right? First, you have to validate the model, make sure everything's working correctly, right? The process is in building a model. Or you, of course, you build the model, and then you have to go through a validation process to, to confirm the accuracy of the model, and it represents what you're looking to analyze. And then you get to the point where, all right, I want to either identify bottlenecks, or I want to determine what my system capacities and constraints are, and you want to get to that analytic piece of the puzzle here of the project. And, and our Autostat module, right, allows you to do uh, a, a lot of that automated, right? You can do a warm-up determination. For those unfamiliar with simulation, there's two types of systems that you think about when you do modeling. There's um, what we call terminating and non-terminating systems. And the easiest thing to, to, let, to describe would be a, a terminating system is one that kind of starts every day um, from scratch. So think about, a, uh, think about going to McDonald's. It opens up every morning. There's no customers, right? Customers come throughout the day. At the end of the day, they close the doors. It starts empty again the next day. That would be like a term, what we call a terminating system. A non-terminating system, simple enough, would be a manufacturing line or a warehouse. Wherever it stops at the end of that day, you're picking up right at that point where the material is located, stuff is in process. So that would be a, a non-terminating system. So in a, in a terminating system, you, you might have to go through some warm-up to get to a steady state before you want to do your analysis, potentially. All right? um, so you might, in any, any type of system, you might want to look at the warm-up. You have a design of experiments. You get all your confidence interval optimization. And of course, I mentioned earlier, we can do multiple machine support in launching multiple runs. I mean, I'll be honest with you. I've done some studies where I've set up runs at night you know, before I go to bed, and I set it up across multiple machines. I'm, I'm making you know, 500, 600, 700 runs because I'm I'm changing one one of my variables. I'm, I want to see, if, say it was a number of vehicles, I want to see how this system works with five, six, seven, eight, nine vehicles. All right? And then I might want to see uh, if I have uh, so many inspection stations and I made that a variable, I want to see how well it works with, um, you know, four, five, six inspection stations. And I might have all these parameters that I want to have a range and find what the optimal configuration is. Well, if you do every combination, then you start running into hundreds of runs. You have to remember if you have variability, which that's the, that's that's the, the value of simulation. If you have variability, you have to make multiple simulation runs of each scenario, right? You can't take one data point of a run that has variability and use that as your exact your exact uh, statistics. You have to make multiple runs of that same set of conditions. You know, three vehicles, three inspection stations, right? I need to make, and I have variability in my model, random sampling, downtime. I need to make numerous runs of those sets of conditions so I get multiple data points around my statistics in order to build these confidence intervals and have confidence in my results. So there's, there's multiple replications and multivariate uh, analysis that causes analysis to, to be very can be very large. Uh, and having others that do all those runs and consolidate the data and compare the results is, is really, really valuable. It saves you a lot of time. You don't have to output to Excel and do your own comparison. So you get the, you get all the runs. You can do designs. You know, this is the, the analyses you could do. And you have confidence intervals. You can, you can get all this data. In this example, I'll give you a simple example. We have pickup locations of product. All right, they go up this elevator. They get transported above the floor, and they come down to a single drop-off point. So under the same volume conditions, 
right? I want to know, under the same volume coming in, I want to know how many vehicles best serve this system. Simple vehicle analysis, small system, but just to give you the idea. So how many vehicles do I need for this system to operate most efficiently? So in this case, I wanted to run with 6 to 12 vehicles, right? So I'm, I'm going to run the scenario with 6 vehicles. Then I'm going to run it with 7, all the way up to 12. And I made, it's a small system, I only made 5 simulation runs of each scenario. So there was a total of 7 shuttle settings, 5 each, 35 runs, right? So the outputs we were collecting were how many jobs were completed every 8 hours. So how many were dropped off over here on the right side every eight hours? How long did they reside in the system? In other words, when when a, a product came in to be picked up at one of these pickup points, um, we marked it with the time it entered. And then when it gets dropped off, when it gets dropped off at the end, we would take what's, how long had that item remained in the system. So we wanted to we know how long it, it stayed in the system. And then the vehicle response time. When it was a request to pick up product, how long did it take for the vehicle to get there? So just looking at things that might represent congestion or efficiency. So when we did this analysis, so this is the this is the chart from Autostat that looked at the system throughput, how many jobs were completed every eight hours. And here's the six vehicles, seven up to 12 vehicles here on the x-axis. What you're seeing is this is the number of completed moves in the eight-hour period. And this is the average, by the way. So you're seeing this six, this average, which is near 800, right around there. This is the average of the five runs that were made with the six vehicles. So you can see eight vehicles. Once we get the nine vehicles, which were somewhere in uh, not quite 1,200, looks like we're just over 11, 1150, then we start leveling off. So adding 10, 11, 12 more vehicles really isn't buying us uh, some. Even if you can tell, it's hard to tell, there's a little dip from 11 to 12 vehicles once you get there. So that was the system throughput. Now take a look at the, the, uh, the time and system, how long the product stayed in the system from the time it came in, the request of vehicle, to the time it was dropped off. So this is in this is in seconds on the y-axis. So in this simple example, you can see they're in the system the shortest amount of time when there's eight vehicles. And then when they start nine, ten, what are we doing logically in a simple example? Because we can go make any one of these runs that we did. We can look at it and look at the animation. Even though when we run Autostat, we're not running it with the animation on. We're letting the CPUs just crank away uh, the Automod models with the animation off, consolidating, getting the data, running as fast as we can. But we can launch every single one of these runs and look at it graphically and see what if we saw an anomaly, what's going on. So in this case, right, eight vehicles, stuff clears the system the fastest. Nine, it starts slowing down. Of course, we're adding congestion, I can tell you right now, as we add 10, 11, and 12 vehicles in this small system. So let's look at the vehicle response time. So in this case, the vehicle response time. In this case, um, what I wanted to do, in this example where I had eight or nine vehicles between those two statistics, you know, eight gets me through the system uh, the, uh, the fastest, nine. So I might look at, depending upon the cost, the, uh, optimize the system, eight, maybe nine, nine vehicles at the most. I wouldn't get any more because I started adding congestion. So simple, simple analyses um, that was done with, with Autostat, and it has a lot of power. Let me go through the next slide. AutoView, so we have Autostat as a module, and we have AutoView. And AutoView is where you see all these um, videos that were being created. They're not created through uh, any type of screen capture. And we actually write out the graphical records of a model for a period of time. And then we have you go in and create the different views. You can pan around the system automatically. You, you, know, you can create these, these fly-throughs animations, and then you can write them out in, in, in real time so the system, that the movement of the system is, is how it would be reflected in the real world if you were standing in that environment. So there's a lot of, um, a lot of capability in, in developing and creating these AVI files. It's a post-process animation. So you define you know, the period of time and the simulation. You want to record the graphics, and then you open up the AutoView model. It loads all those graphical movements. Not, it's not statistical. It's just be able to create, uh, run the graphics for the period of time you recorded, and then create your views, script everything out, and then create you know, video files. So uh, very nice for presentations. And if you're in a services type business, it's great to create videos and use them as part of your, your marketing and, and capabilities uh, presentations. 
We have a model communication model. So this is one that allows you to communicate via ActiveX, OPC, sockets, right? That allows you to use AutoMod as representation of, a, say, a physical system where you need to communicate. Now, your communication could be anything. You could communicate with high-level controllers for, for making decisions, or you could just, you know, uh, communicate uh, and send data one way and feed, feed a database for, for analysis later. So you can do a lot of different things. You can even have multiple models communicating to each other with the clocks synchronized, right? So if you had two models and you wanted them to be, be handshaking and sending information because the systems were so big, Years ago, before memory was so cheap and 64-bit uh, platforms uh, were around, we did a we did a model for the United States Postal Service where we had five different computers uh, communicating between in, in one system level model. One was a scheduling type of thing, saying what to do next on each equipment, and there were other that were strictly equipment models. Another one was with the material handling system, when product needed to be transferred from one machine and needed to be transferred to the other. We would send a request to the material handling machine to say, come pick me up. When it showed up, we'd send a signal to the other model where it would disappear off the conveyor. Now it was in the material handling model traveling to its destination to do the handoff. So you could do a lot of neat things. But now with memory and multi-cores, model-to-model communication isn't, say, as, as uh, important as it used to be. So, of course, the idea is you have an actual system and a control system. But here you replace the actual system you're using in model system, right? And you're interacting with whatever types of information and controls you need to make decisions. Now, AutoMod is used, we have, we have, we have a couple of really big users who use it for their, their emulation and controls testing. I know there's other products out there that can do that, but AutoMod has the capability to do that. We're not controls people, but we allow, the, uh, we allow controls people to then build in their capabilities uh, to communicate between AutoMod and third-party software. So performance, I talked about the accuracy, scalability. Hopefully you saw some of that in those examples. But now we're talking about you know, performance. We have a very efficient material handling template architecture that allows models, big models, if you have and manuf and full facility models to run efficiently. We're compiled. So AutoMod, even the language, the AutoMod language, you know, when we when we talk about uh, it has a language pretty easy to use, but it all gets converted and then it gets compiled in C, right? So we're a compiled product. Compiled, compiled software runs faster, right, than, than, than interpretive software, okay? So we're a compiled, you, you know, uh, uh, software. You can link in, and this is where the controls people do all the time. They link in their own controls uh, in, in C. They can link it in with the models and, and call their functions. So you have the capability of, of, of building your own libraries to include models. You control the level of graphics, right, not the software, which is important. As I, I tried to stress some of that with the different types of graphics you saw in these examples. You have presentation level type models where you can really go uh, crazy and build really nice graphics. Or you can keep them as simple as you want to really get the results, which is really the, the crux of doing a simulation, is to be able to get that analysis done in order to, to have support your recommendations and your designs. Or if you have identified bottlenecks, how to resolve them. So it's key. But we let you control that versus the software. And we're strong, we have, obviously, the, with all this stuff, we have the strong analytics. Uh, scalability, so these are some of the points I wanted to highlight in today's presentation. I think you saw you can do work cell to full facility to outside the facility uh, types of modeling. So it's very, very good, very flexible, from machining models to system and subsystem models to, of course, a full facility type model. So just a couple quick things on a case study. Alcoa was able to save $12 million a year, and what they were doing was looking at their, their overhead bridge cranes, which are very expensive. So it, it used Automod to help them analyze the design concepts, which reduced, okay, reduced the need for uh, some extra cranes that they thought they, they needed. So it was a very, very uh, big project, uh, very good uh, savings for them. So that's just a real simple one. We did this, proje we did this project for Dell Computers, where very interesting. Um, they wanted to quadruple, this is years ago, they wanted to quadruple their production within their Nashville Fulfillment Center where they were making the, the desktop computers. They had old line technology. They had the technology, the newer technology, to change over the old lines, okay, and bring in the, 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 uh, the, the new, newer technology and with automation in order to, they wanted to quadruple their production over a period of like five years which was really interesting because what we did was we modeled the supply of materials to the production line. 
So the problem was, and I'll summarize this, you can read this, but I'll summarize what happened. The, um, when we started increasing the, the manufacturing capacity of the lines, and of course there was uh, material outside the facility that needed to be delivered to the dock doors that they supplied the lines directly. They did not have a ton of storage inside the facility. So they had schedules from vendors around the facility and they had uh, a storage area for the trailers and they had what they call yard dogs moving moving material uh, between all these points. Well, once we started increasing the production, which meant you had to supply the materials faster, it they, the problem came they could not supply the lines. They could not clear the docks. They could not clear the door with the product from the trailers fast enough to increase the production of the facility. They'd be starving the lines. So they, they, they had the technology that could quadruple the production all right, with the equipment inside the four walls. But the problem was outside the four walls in order to make sure they can get the material in, unload them, and to the lines fast enough. So they were only able to probably double it with their existing dock. Right? So the problem is they needed more storage space. They needed to triple the yard dogs. Right? And they had to do a lot. So the simulation was, before they even, say, decided to, to change over these lines, the simulation raised a ton of red flags that they had to do work outside the facility in order to be able to supply the lines. So it was a huge, huge uh, uh, awareness from using simulation uh, at Dell. This was a neat one. This was a uh, order fulfillment operation for uh, Stride Right Shoes. I can say it was Stride Right Shoes, and they had a um, they were doing order fulfillment, and they would for those uh, unfamiliar they they call they call um they they pick things in waves, and a wave would be you know so many stories. They had a hundred they had a hundred packing chutes off of their sorter, so they could they could pack a hundred orders at a time, right? Orders would be orders of multiple different shoe types going to the same destination. So they could pack 100 orders at a time. So they would do these things in waves. They'd finish uh, all these orders that went to these 100 shoots, and they'd have to wait from the, from the time that last pair of shoes was scanned to the time it was packed off of the packing lane, off the sorter, traveling through the system. They had to wait till that last one cleared so they could start the next wave. So there was a 15 to 20 percent downtime between waves. That's how much time they were waiting for that last pair to finish. Because the waves were literally 10 to 12 minutes to process all these orders, high volume, right? Operators are picking stuff out. So we, we helped them analyze. We helped them analyze uh, having two, two waves, dynamically assigning the packing lanes. In other words, they were, they were hard assignments of those lanes for which customers they were going to. We said, well, when you finish a lane, free that lane up and let's assign a new, a new, a new order to that lane and let's let the operator start picking. So we can have multiple multiple ways being done at the same time. So we were able to eliminate downtime by 15 to 20 percent by analyzing the algorithms and the logic used in fulfilling the orders. We didn't change the hardware. Uh, we just helped them evaluate what logic would work to to improve the efficiency of the system. All right. So that kind of wraps it up. So you know, is Automod right for you? I, I think it really comes down to your needs. Of course, if you have a heavy automation and material handling type of uh, requirement, movement of materials critical in your operations in assembly and manufacturing. You know, Automod is, is really really strong. We've been there for a long time. Of course, our, you you have a taste now of our material handling components and the level of detail you get in a customization. We definitely work in the in a true to scale three D environment, and we are we performance of large systems, I still believe there's not a product out there for the level of detail and modeling that can beat automotive performance. This, this baggage handling system, when I was just over in Korea a couple weeks ago for our user group, this had, this had over 100 kilometers of conveyor in one model. It was huge. That's how big the baggage system was for, for uh, the Seoul airport in Incheon. And uh, you know, the, model runs, the model runs efficiently, right? Um, accuracy and scalability, right? We, we, that's, that's our proven uh, footprint in, in, in these types of systems that we model. So just remember, don't let the software control you, right? You get to control the software. All of them, I let you do that. Mm -hmm.